Nestled deep within the rugged wilderness of Vermont, the Bennington Triangle has long been a place of intrigue and mystery. In this remote corner of New England, an unsettling series of unsolved disappearances, strange encounters, and baffling phenomena have left residents and visitors alike perplexed and wary. It's a place where reality seems to bend, where the ordinary gives way to the unexplained, and where the enigma of the Bennington Triangle invites us to delve into its perplexing depths. In 1992, Vermont-based writer Joseph Citro made a startling discovery. He stumbled upon a series of unresolved vanishings within a particular region to the northeast of Bennington, a picturesque town with a population of 15,000, famed for housing Bennington College, a renowned liberal arts institution in the southwestern part of the state. This area's focal point is the majestic Glastonbury Mountain, soaring at a height of 3,748 feet and regularly attracting nature enthusiasts. It was during a public radio broadcast that Citro coined the term Bennington Triangle to encapsulate the eerie phenomenon he had unearthed. Understanding the enduring reputation of this area requires a glimpse into its historical roots. For centuries, and quite possibly even longer, Native American communities inhabiting these lands held a deep-seated belief in the malevolent curse that seemed to shroud Glastonbury Mountain and its encompassing terrain. Among the various reasons behind this superstition was a legend that spoke of an enchanted stone hidden within these woods a stone said to engulf anyone who dared set foot upon it. However, the foremost cause of this eerie reputation stemmed from the relentless conflict waged by the four winds within these very woods. This belief holds particular significance because the region is notorious for its peculiar weather patterns. Most notably, the winds are known to shift direction frequently, a phenomenon that not only bewilders hikers in itself, but also distorts the growth patterns of the local vegetation, causing it to sprout at unusual angles compared to the rest of the world. Consequently, even seasoned hikers familiar with the terrain often concede that navigating this forested expanse can be an unexpectedly disorienting challenge. In the year 1897, Vermont ushered in its first ever deer hunting season, marking a significant moment in the state's outdoor history. Yet on that fateful inaugural day, a chilling and enigmatic incident unfolded within the heart of the Bennington Triangle, forever shrouding the occasion in mystery. John Harbor, a 40-year-old hunter brimming with anticipation for this momentous day, could never have foreseen the grim fate that awaited him. As they began their hunt, a sudden cry shattered the tranquility of the forest. John's desperate exclamation, I've been shot, sent shockwaves through the woods, prompting his brother and a dear friend to react swiftly. Without hesitation, they sprinted towards the source of his cries. However, upon reaching the scene, they were met with a disconcerting and perplexing sight. John had seemingly vanished into thin air, leaving them bewildered and unable to pinpoint his exact location. Hours turned into an anxious night, and the night gave way to dawn, yet there was still no sign of the Woodford resident. Then, in a twist that defied reason, John's lifeless form was discovered the following morning, partially concealed beneath a tree, his trusty firearm resting nearby. What sent shivers down the spines of all who investigated the scene was the unsettling fact that John had not been shot at the spot of his discovery. Equally perplexing was the presence of his fully loaded gun, suggesting he had not taken his own life. The enigma of John Harbor's tragic demise would forever linger in the heart of the Bennington Triangle, a puzzle without a clear solution. Vermont has always been a magnet for nature enthusiasts, drawing like-minded individuals who share a passion for the great outdoors. The enduring legacy of this affinity is embodied by the Green Mountain Club, an organization that persists to this day. Established in 1910, its founders harbored a bold vision to craft an extensive hiking trail spanning the entire length of Vermont. This vision materialized into the Long Trail, a rugged path that traverses the state's magnificent landscapes and was completed in 1930. 
Little did they know that this very trail would play a pivotal role in one of the Bennington Triangle's most haunting mysteries, the second of five baffling disappearances that unfolded within the enigmatic confines of the Triangle between 1945 and 1950. Although the Bennington Triangle is predominantly remembered for the events that transpired in the years that followed this particular incident, it's essential not to disregard the perplexing circumstances surrounding the 1943 disappearance. While this case ultimately yielded a discovered body and a definitive cause of death, lingering questions persist. On Armistice Day of that year, November 11th, Carl Herrick embarked on a hunting expedition into these dense woods, accompanied by his cousin Henry. At some point during their outing, the two became separated. As twilight fell, the first snowflakes began to descend. Henry returned to their campsite, but Carl was conspicuously absent. Growing increasingly concerned, Henry promptly alerted the authorities. After approximately 72 hours of intensive search efforts throughout the area, Carl's lifeless body was located. Similar to the 1897 incident involving John, Carl's firearm had not been discharged and was found roughly 70 feet from his remains. The cause of death was a chilling revelation. It was determined that Carl had suffered such an immense pressure that one of his ribs had punctured his lung. Remarkably, bear-like tracks encircled his lifeless form, suggesting that a large creature had effectively squeezed the life out of him. This explanation, while theoretically plausible, seemed an improbable manner in which to end a human life. In this case, the cause of death raised more questions than it answered. Despite the eerie circumstances, this tragedy did not elicit extensive discussion among the local community, especially when compared to the enigmatic events that were yet to unfold. Nearly two years after the day Carl Herrick met his tragic fate, the life of 74-year-old Maddie Rivers seemed to follow a similarly grim cause. On November 12, 1945, Maddie was strolling along a trail accompanied by his son-in-law, Joe Lazon. As they reached a fork in the path, Maddie expressed his desire to explore a different route briefly, but assured Joe that he would swiftly return to rejoin him and the two others waiting at their campsite. However, despite Maddie's intimate knowledge of the terrain, gained through years of outdoor experience and even serving as a guide, he never made it back to the campsite. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting shadows over the wilderness, alarm bells rang and authorities were alerted. A thorough search effort was initiated, extending over several weeks, yet all they discovered was a solitary rifle cartridge. Maddie himself remained elusive, lost to the unforgiving embrace of the wilderness. The most widely publicized and enduringly known story from the Bennington Triangle resolves around the mysterious disappearance of Paula Weldon, a sophomore at Bennington College in 1946. Intrigued by the allure of the long trail, Paula set out for a solo hike on a late fall Sunday afternoon, just after completing her shift at the school's dining hall. She informed her roommate, Elizabeth Johnson, of her plans and embarked on her journey at approximately 2.45 p.m. With less than two hours of daylight remaining, the weather was initially mild, around 50 degrees, but it would plummet to single-digit temperatures overnight, accompanied by gusty winds. Although her exact thought process remains a mystery, Paula seemed inadequately dressed for the impending cold, sporting only a red coat and jeans, likely unaware of the extreme temperature drop that awaited her after sunset. Moments after her departure, Danny Fager, the owner of a gas station near the college's entrance, reported spotting someone matching Paula's description, running up and down a gravel pit before vanishing from sight. Approximately 15 minutes after leaving campus, Paula was picked up as a hitchhiker by Lewis Knapp, who identified her based on her description. He drove her to his residence, conveniently close to one of the trail's entry points where he dropped her off. Around 3.45 p.m., Ernie Whitman and several others observed Paula on her way to the long trail, with sunset merely 35 minutes away. Ernie, concerned about her attire and the dwindling daylight, urged her to reconsider her plans. Despite these warnings, Paula pressed on, entering the trail's path, never to be seen again. 
As nightfall descended back at the college, Elizabeth grew increasingly anxious. She initially harbored hopes that Paula had returned and was quietly engrossed in studying or some other on-campus activity. However, as morning arrived and Paula remained absent, Elizabeth shared her concerns with others. Lewis Webster Jones, the school's president, swiftly contacted Paula's parents, Jean Douglas and William Archibald Weldon, residing in Stamford, Connecticut, some 150 miles to the south. Jones inquired whether Paula might have traveled home to spend Sunday evening with her family. This inquiry prompted panic in both parents, with W. Archibald immediately making his way to Bennington. W. Archibald played a proactive role in organizing search efforts, rallying volunteers and law enforcement officers from multiple states. Despite these extensive endeavors and the offering of a $5,000 reward, equivalent to about $78,000 in 2023, Paula was never located, and no evidence related to her disappearance was ever uncovered. While dissatisfaction with the perceived ineffectiveness of the search efforts resulted in the formation of the Vermont State Police a year later, Paula's vanishing act was just one of several unexplained disappearances within the enigmatic Bennington Triangle. Exactly three years after Paula's ill-fated hike, on December 1st, 1949, the Bennington Triangle claimed another mysterious disappearance. James Tedford, a veteran residing at the Bennington Soldiers' Home, had spent time in St. Albans, a city located 150 miles north of Bennington, just beyond Vermont's largest city, Burlington. On this particular day, he embarked on a bus journey back to Bennington. Peculiarly, multiple witnesses confirmed that James had indeed boarded the bus in St. Albans and was observed on it even as it departed its second to last stop before reaching Bennington. However, curiously, there were no recollections of him arriving in Bennington, nor were there any sightings of him anywhere else thereafter. It's worth noting that James's disappearance was not reported to the authorities until more than a week had passed, with nearly another week elapsing before witnesses were interviewed. This delay in reporting stemmed from the assumption by those in St. Albans that he had successfully completed his journey, while his Bennington home presumed he had opted to postpone his return. Consequently, there is a possibility that witnesses' memories may not have been entirely accurate. Nevertheless, one fact remains undeniable. James Tedford inexplicably vanished somewhere within the perplexing confines of the Bennington Triangle. On the subsequent Columbus Day, an unsettling incident unfolded. Eight-year-old Paul Jepson accompanied his mother in her truck as she set out to relocate some pigs. However, upon her return, a chilling discovery awaited her. Paul had vanished without a trace. Strikingly, like Paula before him, Paul was clad in a red jacket, making one wonder why locating either of them had proven so elusive. Yet Paul, too, suffered the same inexplicable fate. His whereabouts remained a haunting mystery. During the search efforts, the New Hampshire State Police deployed bloodhounds, which traced Paul's scent to a location eerily reminiscent of where Paula had last been seen just before her enigmatic disappearance. Subsequently, Paul's father revealed that his son had frequently expressed an interest in venturing into the nearby mountains. It is plausible that once his mother had left him alone, Paul acted upon this desire, potentially offering a haunting clue to the circumstances surrounding his vanishing act. Shortly thereafter, on October 28, 1950, Freda Langer, an experienced hiker, embarked on a hiking expedition with her cousin, Herbert Elsner. However, a misfortune befell Freda when she accidentally tumbled into a creek, saturating her clothing. Eager to change into dry attire, she informed Herbert of her plan to return to their campsite for a quick change before rejoining him. Their intention was to resume their planned 10-mile hike. Tragically, Freda never made it back to the campsite. In the ensuing weeks, exhaustive search efforts were launched, but they yielded no sign of her whereabouts. However, the following spring brought a grim discovery. Freda's lifeless body was found just over three miles from the campsite, an area that had been scoured by several search parties the previous autumn. Due to the passage of time and various other factors, the cause of her death remained elusive and undetermined. Several striking similarities tie together the five disappearances that occurred within the perplexing Bennington Triangle from 1945 to 1950. 
Notably, all these mysterious incidents unfolded during the last quarter of the year, with late afternoons, spanning from 3 to 5 p.m., shrouded in enigma. Additionally, a peculiar link emerged as two of the vanished individuals, Paula and Paul, were both wearing red jackets, leading to local superstitions associating the color red with ill fortune. The inclination to attribute these disappearances to a serial killer is a natural one. When numerous people vanish or die under mysterious circumstances within the same area over a brief period, However, these cases diverged significantly in terms of the victim's gender, age, and circumstances. Serial killers tend to adhere to a certain victim profile, unless the crimes were merely opportunistic acts. An alternative theory posits that each individual may have become disoriented and lost, possibly due to unforeseen and occasionally localized weather conditions. The bewildering shifting winds prevalent in the region could have exacerbated the situation. Another consideration is the presence of numerous old wells, mine shafts, cellars, and caves in the area. It's conceivable that the missing individuals accidentally fell into these perilous openings. It's worth noting that individuals experiencing hypothermia often exhibit a tendency to burrow and seek refuge in small enclosed spaces. To a delirious mind, a cave or well might appear as such a sanctuary. Assertions regarding Paula's mental state at the time of her disappearance have led some to speculate that she may have intentionally chosen not to return. However, even if this were true for her case, it seems improbable that the same motive would apply to all these individuals. Lastly, theories invoking UFOs, alien abductions, and the legendary Bennington monster have also found a place within the tapestry of conjecture surrounding these perplexing disappearances. While the enigmatic events within the Bennington Triangle notably dwindled in frequency after 1950, they remained an unsettling presence persisting through the years. In 1981, the region bore witness to the baffling disappearance of three hunters, leaving behind no trace or indication of their whereabouts. 27 years later, Robert Singley, a 27-year-old music composition teacher at Bennington College, appeared to teeter on the precipice of permanent disappearance, yet he emerged to recount his harrowing tale. Robert embarked on a hike in the very same location where Paula Weldon had last been seen, albeit presumably for a different purpose. His objective, amid the serene natural beauty, was to craft a string quartet composition. However, as he retraced his steps on the journey back, he found himself disoriented, failing to locate his car. A thick shroud of fog rolled in as the sun dipped below the horizon. Robert was adrift, bereft of a GPS, compass, or map, with only a malfunctioning headlamp for guidance. That somber night stretched into a restless, sleepless ordeal, but ultimately, the sun's rays pierced the darkness once more, and Robert endured. As he resumed his journey, he was confronted by a disorienting reality. Terrain that should have been familiar appeared entirely foreign. However, finally at 11.30 a.m., he was discovered by authorities and returned to civilization. Reflecting on his night of solitude, Robert described the eerie ambiance, recounting how a tree that had provided him refuge seemed to emanate an unsettling and haunting energy. This silence that enveloped him throughout the night was deafening, and the illogical nature of his ordeal defied comprehension. In more recent times, during the summer of 2019, Jessica Hildenbrandt, known by the moniker Red, was discovered lifeless in a gravel pit within the confines of the Bennington Triangle. Her identity remained concealed until the following year, when DNA analysis provided identification. Intriguingly, an individual, Devin Moffat, faced charges in connection with her murder. A red-related incident echoed two summers later, when Joseph Schoenig, owner of a red truck, was found within the vehicle parked within the enigmatic triangle. Tragically, he had fallen victim to a self-inflicted gunshot wound, having been missing for a fortnight before his discovery. Despite the passage of time and ongoing mysteries, the enigmatic circumstances enveloping numerous disappearances and deaths within the Bennington Triangle persist to this day. However, a significant distinction emerges when comparing the events that transpired from 1945 to 1950 with more recent tragedies, the enduring veil of secrecy shrouding those earlier incidents. Even in the solitary case where a body was recovered among those six, 
it failed to unveil the ultimate cause of her demise. Perhaps what makes this enigma most compelling is the unexplained disappearances, those elusive mysteries that continue to defy rational explanation.